Okay, hello everybody. Um, we're going to talk about some of the advanced capabilities of the utility network today. Doing uh, this presentation, we have Remy. Remy is our product manager on the uh, utility network team, and I'm Eric Cole. I'm the development lead on the GeoDatabase team. To start off, let's uh, let's discuss the architecture a little bit. Now, here's one way of looking at it. Essentially, we started off this project by having feature services as part of ArcGIS Enterprise. Feature services, of, of course, are responsible for all the editing and whatnot of features that are inside enterprise geodatabases and other types of geodatabases. Um, but as part of this project, we've developed some new services. One is the utility network service that, that supports operations such as being able to validate your network topology or build your network index, uh, tracing, being able to do sub-network management, etc. Uh, we also have a network diagram service. Uh, the diagram service is responsible. It's a key part of the utility network. Um, and it allows you to author your network diagrams, your sch schematic, uh, schematic diagrams or logical representations of your data. Um, used for things like configuring the diagrams and all the management, creation, deletion, renaming, all the rest of your, of your diagrams. Uh, the version management service, um, this is responsible for supporting the advanced transaction model that's built on top of branch versioning. You can do things such as creating versions, deleting versions, reconciling versions, posting versions, all the behavior that you would expect through version management. And then finally, we have a uh, validation service. This is a uh, uh, an ArcGIS enterprise-based technology that allows you to uh, validate your attribute validation rules as well as your batch calculation rules all in a uh, service-based uh, environment. So on the this is, this is a useful diagram when we start thinking about how the system in a uh, service-based architecture is architected. Looking a little bit from a different perspective, what happens if you were looking at it through the, traditional version of a uh, client server. Here on the very top, we see ArcGIS Pro or, or the Pro Managed SD, SDK for those of you that are authoring your own uh, applications or add-ins. Uh, that conceptually sits on top of the geodatabase, which itself is working through an enterprise workspace to connect to enterprise geodatabases, Oracle, SQL Server, Postgres, SAP HANA, our enterprise geodatabases. Now, the picture changes a little bit if you're running in a service-based environment. You can see here, much the same on the client side, but here when we're working through services, the geodatabase is actually connecting through the feature service workspace, which communicates to a REST API that's exposed through ArcGIS Enterprise uh, using JSON for communication. And you can see the four there are actually the five uh, services that we talked about previously. The feature service on the left, as well as the utility network service, network diagram service, version management service, and validation service. And they themselves sit on top of the geodatabase, which is actually consuming an enterprise workspace that's connecting to an enterprise geodatabase. Okay? Well, that's another way of looking at the system. Now, one of the nice things about a service-based uh, architecture is you can also then have your your web applications that are authored using JavaScript, using our JavaScript SDK, which are communicating through the same mechanisms to ArcGIS Enterprise, again, using JSON to hit the REST API. It's the exact same REST API that is being used by ArcGIS Pro. Same one. Okay. Now, if you're then working in the runtime or mobile space, it's a little bit different. Uh, you're going to be using the runtime geodatabase uh, implementation that's part of runtime core, but that runtime geodatabase will be communicating again through JSON and hitting ArcGIS Enterprise and the REST APIs that we've been talking about previously. So hopefully this gives you a little bit more granularity when you're working with ArcGIS Enterprise and a service-based architecture you can see the different types of clients that we can support namely desktop clients like ArcGIS Pro we can do thin client web apps that are authored through the JavaScript SDK or we can support mobile applications that are using the runtime core and the runtime geodatabase information model now 
big change is at 2.6. We've been working pretty hard on this the entire team. We wanted to, where a big requirement is actually to support electric underground and telco and fiber systems. Um, so we've gone and enhanced the, the uh, information model to provide support for new abstractions that we're terming junction objects and edge objects. These objects are essentially non non-spatial features that can be contained, in, contained inside other spatial features or even other non-spatial features. Uh, so non-spatial features can be contained in other non-spatial features who themselves may be contained in spatial features. Sort of the turtle on turtle metaphor. Um, this uh, support for objects is necessary, these edge and junction objects is necessary for doing things like uh, modeling fiber strands inside of fiber cables where a big fiber cable may contain thousands of fiber strands. Or in electric underground, maybe you have many ducts inside a duct bank um, or cables inside a duct inside a duct bank. Edge objects correspond to edge elements inside the network index, and junction objects correspond to junction elements inside the network index. And you can see our naming convention, very standard, prefix it with the domain network name and then suffix it with either junction object or edge object. Uh, so if you were doing some fiber stuff, it would be uh, in a fiber domain network, you'd see fiber junction object and fiber edge object being created. Um, we're also, uh, we also have edge object tables and structure junctions as well. Those are also being created. Now, an important thing to note is that there aren't going to be any schema changes on your existing device junction assembly or line classes. One important change with the information model in order to support uh, this, this extended information model is that error tables are changing. Uh, with version 4, essentially what we're releasing with, uh, with ArcGIS 2.6 and uh, 10.8.1, um, we we're persisting the error information a little bit differently. We no longer just have a table, point line and polygon error feature tables. What we're doing is with you have errors that are associated with features. We will persist those inside an enhanced dirty areas table. Um, along, so you'll have an error code and an error message uh, persisted inside the dirty area table for feature errors. And if you have object errors, these are errors that will be associated with your junction or edge objects. Their error codes and error messages will be persisted inside the associations table. If you go and look at a, a rough uh, pictorial representation of our information model, most of you will have seen this before, you can see there are some things. These are the, This diagram is meant to highlight the changes that we're making. Uh, we talked about before with our domain networks, we're adding two new, uh, two new tables to it, the junction objects and the edge objects. You can see that on the far, uh, far right portion of the of the image. In the center, center south area, you can see that we've also augmented the structure network to have structure junction objects and structure edge objects for similar reasons as we're doing with domain networks. Those are additions to the information model. We're doing modifications to the uh, information model on the associations table and the dirty areas table. You can see those sort of on the, on the, on the left side of the diagram towards the top near the arrows. We're adding additional fields in order to represent things, such as the error information that we spoke about in the preceding slide. Also, you will see the point, line, and uh, polygon error tables disappearing with, uh, with the version 4 utility networks. Those are no longer needed because the error information is now more appropriately being persisted inside the associations or dirty area tables. Now, when we look at these new network classes, uh, junction and edge objects are locatable generally. Um, junction objects can be contained within a spatial feature found in some sort of a containment hierarchy. Uh, so you could have a junction object contained within a point feature, or you could have a junction object contained within another con uh, junction object contained within, say, a, uh, a device feature using that as a type of point feature, okay? So then you can infer that the junction objects have the same uh, location, they're locatable as the containing uh, device uh, 
feature. Edge objects uh, similarly can be contained within spatial features inside a containment or attachment hierarchy. Um, so for example, you can have ducts, which could be edge objects contained within a duct bank, which is a, uh, which is a line feature. Um, alternatively, you could have edge objects contained inside edge objects contained within other lines or linear features. Additionally, maybe the edge object is only uh, positionable or locatable at its two endpoints. Uh, that is also supported inside our model. Now, it's important to keep in mind the junction of edge objects sometimes may not be locatable. They may not have a geom derived geometric location. Um, this happens, for example, when you load a whole collection of non-spatial objects into tables and then enable your network topology before creating a slew of containment or attachment associations with other spatial features. Um, now, similar to other, other feature tables that we have, you can add fields uh, to these classes. Now, edge objects are connected to jug junction objects either through junction edge or edge junction edge connectivity associations. Um, and junction objects themselves can serve as controllers, much as devices, and can have terminal configurations. Interesting aspect is junction objects, we've extended the information uh, uh, model to also support mid-span junction objects. So junction objects can occur at mid-span on edge, edge objects. Okay. Um, and we have an additional type of connectivity association that you see in blue in the diagram below. Um, in this diagram, very quickly, let's talk through it. Uh, you, see the, you see the legends on the left and right sides. Across the top row, we have five dirty areas labeled 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Those are the purple, purple squares. Uh, they are associated with a junction or a point feature which could be a device that's uh, the gray one and the point feature is geometrically connected to a line feature as we move from left to right which is line one which is then connected to point two again through geometric coincidence point two has a dirty area dirty area number three the uh, point feature number two is geometrically connected to line two Line two has, is associated with dirty area four, and line two is also geometrically connected to point three, which corresponds to, which also could have dirty area five. Now, when we start looking at the uh, edge and junction objects, uh, we see first a number of containment associations. For example, we see on the bottom row, we see uh, junction object two, with a junction edge connectivity association to edge object one. Edge object one is also has junction edge connectivity to junction object three along the bottom. Uh, junction object two on the southwest corner has a containment association with point feature one. That's through containment association one, the green, the green uh, circle there. Uh, edge object one has two containment associations. It has a containment association two to line one. It also has a containment uh, association four to line two. Um, also, one thing that's interesting, we do have mid-span connectivity here represented. So line one has mid-span connectivity with junction object one, through junction mid-span connectivity association one. That's the blue uh, vertical uh, association that you see in the diagram. Junction object one is contained within point feature two through containment association three in the diagram. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about tracing. Basically, when you want to perform analytics against your network, um, 
we have an array of analysis and tracing tools that can support all kinds of analytic workflows. These things allow you to do things such as uh, perform inspections of your network following a big storm event, uh, determine the number of customers with access to the resource, you know, how many people are being served by in my water network through this pump station, allowing you to create summary reports to present uh, you know, things such as the number of customers being supplied by a specific circuit or or, or whatnot in, uh, in an electrical network. Uh, you can do things, you can trace uh, the features upstream or downstream from a given utility. You can uh, figure out what valves that need to be, you can do isolation traces to figure out if you have a, a rupture in a water main, which valves need to be closed in order to stem the flow. Um, also, um, you can model multiple utility systems within one utility network and you can run tracing, tracing analysis on all of them. So you can have water and electric and gas inside the same utility network. So what is tracing at a very abstract level? It, it's basically about identifying a subset of the utility network elements that meet a specified criteria. Uh, um, and tracing is one mechanism that allows us to take all this network data, all these assets, and provide a lot of business value to our utility customers, utility and telco customers. It allows you to answer your questions and solve problems about the current state of, the state of your network. For example, like we were saying before, what valves need to be closed to shut off gas to a location. Okay. Um, it also can be used to uh, help design future facilities. You know, for example, how many houses are being fed by a transformer and do we have the available capacity to handle the load that would be uh, required by another connection or do we need to change the transformer to a larger, higher, tra higher capacity transformer? Um, allows, also allows you to organize your business practices, do things like uh, create a circuit map, uh, to give to your work crews, uh, to do damage assessment after a storm event, such as an ice storm or a, or a tornado or a hurricane or something like that, a way to apportion work. Maybe you want to do tree trimming and let's, we want to be able to provide them with a circuit map to show them exactly where they need to trim the trees. Now, some of the key abstractions with uh, tracing are things such as starting points. Uh, many of the traces that you're going to be running uh, require are all about radiating outward from a specific location or set of locations. These are the starting points. Um, and you can use the trace locations pane to add them or delete them. And they can be placed, these starting points, on either junctions or edges inside your network. Um, trace locations also, if you're selecting a point feature that supports terminals, it will allow you to specify which terminal upon which to use as a, for example, starting point or one of these trace locations. On a circuit breaker where you have a high and a low side or a source and load side, you know, which side do you mean? Uh, it's a point feature, point geometry, but what's, what logical side of this point feature do you mean? Um, Starting points are then assembled uh, and stored in a feature class inside the default project workspace. Barriers. Barriers are uh, a little bit analogous to starting points, but they're used to alternate, uh, alternately define the locations where the traversal uh, during a trace operation should terminate. Okay. Um, and you can again use the trace locations pane to add them or delete them. Um, and they can be placed on junctions or edges. One thing to note, if you're familiar with our transportation network model, the network data set, um, you'll find many of these concepts similar where they also had starting points and they also had barriers inside road or transportation networks. And similar to starting points, barriers are stored in a feature class in the default project workspace. Trace types. Um, out of the box, we we uh, we provide eight generic uh, trace types. These are the basic uh, algorithms that then can be configured uh, to perform the analytic that you're interested in. And here we can see in this pane the eight different types: connected, subnetwork, upstream, isolation, shortest path, whatnot. 
trace configurations. Um, this is this is what's used to provide input uh, to the trace uh, operation that defines what constitutes traversability, and that helps determine what features will be returned as well as what types of calculation should be performed during this trace in identifying the features to be returned. Now. Let's think a little bit more carefully about connectivity versus traversability. Um, connectivity, when we talk about network models, it's the state where two or more features uh, share a connectivity association or a collection of features is geometrically coincident at an endpoint or mid-span at a vertex, and a connectivity rule exists that supports that relationship. So in this example, we see some connectivity associations represented as dashed lines and then some other lines. And this is, I guess, in a medium voltage uh, electric uh, example. So we have two connectivity associations and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven uh, other, uh, other lines and, and, and then some more junctions. And they're all connected to each other. Now, traversability is a different concept. It's used to describe the state where two features that are already connected also have a path between them that satisfies the trace configuration. It has to satisfy this configuration that you've, that you've uh, put in place. So let's say through your trace configuration, you have configured the system such that this middle line that's now represented in red is no longer considered traversable, okay? That would then result in essentially those two traversability groups, group one in green and group two in blue, uh, not having any traversability between the two, although there is technically connectivity between the two groups. Okay, So that's the difference between traversability and connectivity. Now, what happens when you're uh, these user experience workflows when you're when you're using uh, the trace tools? Uh, well, you can see here in the trace pane, say you select one, and let's in this example, it looks like we've selected the subnetwork trace. Uh, and then you see on the right, you see the GP tool that exposes the tracing framework with the trace type pre-populated to be subnetwork. Um, at this point, you will then go in and you'll place one or more starting points. You can place optional barriers. You can select or change the trace type. Then you can fill in all the various different trace configuration options that you see inside this large geoprocessing tool. And then finally, you'll click Run and execute the trace and get the result back. Now, one thing that's important to note is that although this this GP tool, the trace tool, is fairly complex and can be cumbersome for most users, you can author and configure these things uh, using the managed SDK and all that to create custom trace tools and, and, and other things like that that can simplify the user experience for the user community such that they don't have to worry about going through the process of configuring, doing all the trace configuration. They can merely have a starting point, select the tool, and hit go. Okay, So that's part of this thing is really a framework that then people can configure and do various things that they are interested in. Propagation. Um, propagation is a very abstract, or a very advanced topic um, that we it's important to get your head around, uh, particularly if you're doing sophisticated analytics or tracing against your network. Um, attribute propagation. Basically, networks we see have attributes that will change uh, with distance as people are radiating away from a starting point. For example, pressure in a pipe network as you get away from the pump station. As the water flows away from the pump, the pressure decreases due to friction and other problems uh, that can occur or restrictions in flow. Attribute propagation is used. Uh, we developed attribute propagation to allow you to model this behavior. Uh, and propagation can occur whenever a subnetwork is updated, exported, or traced. Uh, propagation values 
are stored in memory and are not persisted. Um, a canonical example of propagation is phase propagation. Basically, when you open and close switches along a network, they can restrict or enable some phases to continue along in the trace when you're doing a phase-based trace. Uh, propagators are used to calculate the value of these attributes for the features that are downstream of controllers inside your network. Now, that allows you to make an edit, but not have to do compensating edits downstream in order to get correct analytical results. Think about it from an electrical network perspective and pay attention to the diagram at the bottom. Um, and it's uh, at the controller, we have the source side and the load size, and let's say the controller supports phases A, B, C. Um, in this example, if phase A is de-energized downstream of the controller, the propagator will calculate the phase value of downstream features that will have phase A de-energized, although the network attribute of the features may indicate phase A is enabled. So here we see the attribute, the phase attribute, and for each of these features you can see from left to right, A, B, C going across, finally we wind up at A, B. Now, Let's say a user makes an edit to the phase attribute of this middle feature and changes the phase value from ABC to BC. Now, if you look at the propagated value when we say do a downstream trace from the load side of a controller, it starts off at ABC, passes through the next feature, still ABC, it's the feature that has had the edit applied to phase, so ABC changes to BC in memory as the propagated value. Then BC turns into B because that next downstream feature only supports A and B, and the propagated value is BC, so the only propagated value at this point is B because A was disabled upstream. So you can see how the propagated value moving from left to right eventually winds up at B, although the phases, you know, when you look at them, um, we didn't have to make edits to the two rightmost uh, features in order to get the correct propagated value through the system. Now, only attributes that are network attributes can be propagated. Um, let's look at a pipe network. Suppose uh, we have a network attribute, the pressure, the PSI value, and that's going to be our propagated value. We can specify a, a function for propagation that can be used to calculate the pressure reading of the next pipe or device that's equal to or less than the pressure of the preceding pipe or device. So in this example, you can see the controller, maybe it's a pump downstream, it has a PSI of 100, and, you know, three-fifths of the way across, a pipe says, okay, the PSI or whatever it is, says the PSI value changes to 90. Now, let's say someone does an edit to a device, feature with point geometry, and changes the PSI value from 100 to 80. Now, when we look at the propagated value, it starts off as we start at the downstream uh, terminal on the controller at 100, and as it moves from left to right, Eventually, we're going to hit the device where the, where the PSI value the pro, is 80, so the propagated value changes from 100 to 80. And then you can see, despite the pipe or the device even further downstream of that saying it can handle 90, the propagated value of the pressure is only 80 as it moves all the way across. Okay. Now, propagation configurations, you define them at the tier level, and they will apply to all the subnetworks in a tier. And you configure them using the set subnetwork definition when you are uh, uh, when you're configuring your uh, your network. There are various different properties that you'll be uh, specifying and configuring, things such as the attribute name, the function that's being used, the operator that's going to be used with the function being either bitwise, min, or max, the operator that you're going to have if you want to do calculations, the value that's being uh, compared, 
propagated attribute. This is the name of the field to persist the propagated values during the update subnetwork operation, as well as a substitution attribute when you do when substitution comes to play. We'll talk a little bit about that later on. Um, how does it kind of work? Well, propagated values, we, we compute them as a pre-processing step before a trace operation if the trace is subnetwork based, meaning it's either an upstream trace, downstream trace, subnetwork trace, or subnetwork controller, or isolation trace. These are the five different trace types that are subnetwork based. And in, with these five, we will go and do propagation prior to doing any trace operation. So we'll start at each controller, and then the propagator will use the propagated function and the network attribute to calculate each value at each network element. Okay. Um, and then during the main trace later on, after the after the propagation has completed, the calculated values or filters can then be tested at the same time as other traversal filters. Looking at the functions, there are three different types available right now for propagating. We have min and max when you have numeric values or bitwise and when you have numerical values that are representing bit set uh, collections. A bitwise and takes two Two different values and will that are representing a bit set and we'll and them together at the bit level. Um, why would you do this? Well, in electric in electric domain phase, you could model them using three bits: one bit for phase A, one for phase B, one for phase C. Uh, together, if you had ABC enabled, it could be represented using a binary number one 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 or seven when it's uh, converted into decimal notation. So if one of the bits is de-energized, say we turn off B, the, only, the other two bits are energized, A and C, the binary number becomes 101, where 0 in the middle means that B is de-energized, and that corresponds to a decimal value of 5. Okay, So this is a pretty simple example, but you can remember some of your old computer science and Boolean arithmetic. Pretty simple concept. Now, substitution... Uh, a substitution is a type of network attribute. These are interesting. Um, it's a value that's used to calculate the propagated value uh, where uh, the attribute substitution category has been assigned to its asset type. Um, the substitution value is then used to calculate the value for the next connected feature downstream. Okay, to use substitution, you must have propagation properly configured. Um, and substitution, one of the motivating examples for substitution was uh, electric network, where lines are tapped off of other lines, or when phase swaps occur. Okay, um, And the trace framework will only consider substitutions on features that have uh, the attribute substitution category specified. Network attributes. Properties of a network that are used to control traversability. We've talked about them before. Uh, you can have cost attributes or descriptors. Descriptors are used to describe characteristics of the network, such as being open-closed versus values or cost attributes, voltage or pressure drops. Subnetwork management. There are connected subportions of the network that are used for driving analytics, labeling, visualization, or assigning units of work. Uh, they correspond to circuits in electric or pressure zones in gas and water, or trunk lines in wastewater. Um, here you can see the. Um, this is this is a representation of the the changes that are being made to the system with uh, with version four of the utility network. You see the junction objects as well as the modifications to point line and polygon errors. These are the portions that por correspond to subnetwork management. We have the subnetworks, the subnet lines inside the domain networks, as well as the domains and domains tiers and subnetworks themselves. Um, they're basically used to organize networks and then allow, uh, allow us to model, model large, logically separate sections of the whole system. Um, a network can have one or more domain networks. We talked about that before, and the number of domains depends upon the type of model being built and the industry being managed. Um, 
Now, tiers, within each domain network, you can have a collection of tiers, which are used to define logical levels within the network. Um, in electric distribution, they can be sub-transmission, medium voltage, low voltage. Um, domain networks can have one or more tiers, and structure networks do not have any tiers, nor do they have sub-networks. Uh, so a tier can be a considered a collection of features that form groupings that represent logical subnetworks that deliver the resource, such as a circuit in electric or pressure zones in gas or water. Uh, subnetworks are associated with one or more controllers, um, and subnetwork names and subnetwork controller names are maintained as system managed attributes on device feature classes. Network diagrams. Um, they're comparable to the ArcGIS uh, schematics extension uh, from way back. Um, they're a core capability of every utility network. We know that users need to have logical as well as geographic representations of your data, so we put network diagrams in as a core component of the utility network model. And it supports a full set of geoprocessing tools, actually a crazy large collection of geoprocessing tools, as you can see in this visualization. Diagram types, um, they're system generated diagrams. Um, those are the ones that are created and updated as a byproduct of update subnetwork. You can have user generated stored diagrams. Those are the ones that you create and you have saved into your geo database. And you can also create temporary diagrams. These are ones that reside in the current project and are deleted when you no longer reference them. Different types of layout. There are 16 layout types, and it's used to determine how features are displayed in the diagram relative to other features. You can do things like uh, geoposition things. You can have smart trees, tree-like representations of your, uh, of your data. And they can be applied, these layout algorithms or layouts, to all types of diagrams. And there are 16 to choose from. Rules. We have quite a few rules. There are 18 rules, and these are used the, they are used to impact the overall layout of the diagram, such as there's a reduced junction rule or a trace rule. These are ways that you can configure out of very fine grained how you want your diagrams to be automatically configured. And they can, again, be applied to all types of diagrams. Templates. You can create diagram templates, and they're stored within the utility network, and they have a set of rules and layouts that are used to display the diagram. They, again, can be applied to all types of diagrams, either user-generated or system-generated and maintained. Generation process, you do the build, the basic build, then you can apply optional diagram rules that are executed in a user-specified order to discard features, add objects, simplify the diagram through reduction or collapsing objects or expanding containers, whatnot. And then you can optionally apply also diagram uh, automated layouts. Okay, and these can be chained together. Thanks, Eric. Let's go ahead and go into the network properties itself and see what makes up that subnetwork. So we'll open up our electric network and explore our tiers. So this is this is uh, the cornerstone of the trace capability and the subnetwork trace. So, for example, if we were to run a trace on an electrical distribution system, we can see the behaviors of the trace already baked into the properties of that tier. That it gives us uh, not only the barriers, but also the propagated the propagated values, uh, such as uh, adding the um, the calculation of the power device rating, uh, calculating the line of the subnetwork. So one of the latest features in the utility network is the addition of non-spatial edges and objects. So let's go ahead and take a look at the new object tables. So you can see in this project, I've got edge and junction object tables both for the structure elements or the structure domain and the electric domain of my project. Opening up the electric junction object um, shows us how these non-spatial elements still have asset group and asset type um, levels of specificity. So this enables you on the operational domain side to be able to create um, non-spatial 
junction objects for any type of point feature. And with that point, um, or with that point like feature with no geometry, uh, you can still have uh, the appropriate connectivity, containment, or structural associations. Matter of fact, the tables that are generated uh, with the creation of a utility network have a lot of power already built into them. You have the ability to extend that capability and modify these tables as you see fit. Um, looking briefly at the uh, structure objects, we can see, even though I don't have any uh, objects built in this, um, this project, that I have the same fields and the same capability uh, to be able to modify this table to suit the needs of um, the project or schema of your organization. So let's go ahead and um, let's just add a new transformer here and I'll drop down to the bottom of my table and if I were to create a transformer, uh, for this case, I will use an attribute rule uh, that'll fire off <clears throat> as I populate the label text and I create this new transformer location. It will also fire off non-spatial records to represent the three phases of my new device. So it just fired off a um, non-spatial element for the C, B, and A phase. Let's take a look at this in the attribute pane. So if I were to select the transformer that I just edited, we could see that the transformer contains three non-spatial objects. One for the A phase, one for the B phase, one for the C phase. So these non-spatial elements, uh, be it edge or junction, have every capability of the um, features that have geometry. Thank you.